Wow, this is this is new. This is nice. It's, it's nice, isn't it? It's really comfortable. <laughs> wow, <laughs> this is kind of nice. This feels a little bit. I feel a bit closer to everyone here. Does anyone else feel like that? Or is it just me? Thank you. All right, it's all right. Right, you know, like what, 2,000 kilometers away now. Well, as you know, um, things haven't quite worked out for Jess and I and um, with our visas, and we've come back early. Um, but we believe there are some blessings in that. And just before I kind of get on with my message, I just wanted to ask, well, who actually read the, the news that we had about the outreach? Would have been the last news last, uh, Okay. Okay, a couple of people. Okay, so there's, a, there's quite a few amazing stories in there, and there even a couple that I didn't really have a chance to put in. I kind of tried to jam it all together. But um, uh, one of my favorite stories, which probably wasn't the most miraculous, but it was one of my favorite, we had this young boy called, well, his name's actually quite long, but we just call him Sam for short, because his full name is about 12 more syllables. Anyway, and he, he went with his team up into, look, hiking into the mountains. They found this little village full of witchcraft and the voodoo and, and all that kind of nonsense. And... Uh, when I got there, the entire village of something like 40 or 50 different families, they all just said, no, we don't want a bar of you, kind of just move on. Like, we don't want to, we want to hear the gospel, we don't want to hear whatever this is about. You know, one guy said, look, you can just sleep on the floor in the corner of my house, but don't touch my food, we'll see you later. You know, and so they were pretty disheartened. And so then, for that night, they thought, well, we've been hiking all day, we're starving, and so they found this big fruit tree that they had kind of in the village. And Sam, young Sam, decides, well, I'm going to climb that tree and get some fruit because we're really hungry. So as he's climbing up this tree, and these trees are really big, you know, some of these out there in the, in the mountains, there's this enormous tree, and he's climbing right to the top, you know, picking some fruit, and he slips and falls, basically the whole length of this tree, and it's flat on the ground. And gets up, brushes himself up, and he's like, totally fine. And, and there's a whole crowd of people from the village standing there. And they just said, that's a miracle. And he's like, oh, was it? <laughs> they said, yes, we've seen that they fairly die off this tree. And we've gotten up without a scratch. And so suddenly the entire village opened up and said, all right, you can start for the week. And they talked about this, this genius and this gospel that, that you've come to bring. And they did exactly that. They said for the whole week and they're going back again. And so they had this entire village of something like 50 families that are now opening up their homes to, to the gospel. Isn't that great? <laughs> and I, I had that story, just a more short version of that in the, in the newsletter, but that was just one of my favorites because sometimes we see miracles, we see great things happen, but then when it's connected with, with something really purposeful as that, it's a lot more powerful. You know, because it's not just like, I mean, you know, I fell off a tree and I didn't get hurt. Yeah, that's a cool miracle. I fell off a tree, didn't get hurt, and 50 people with 50 families got saved. You know, oh, that's. I was like, oh, yeah, isn't it? <laughs> you know, it's like, I believe that God's purposeful when he does things. When he, when he does miracles, you know, he, he has a reason. God, God doesn't, you know, doesn't sort of throw darts at the wall and go, oh, that'll happen and that'll happen. No, God has a plan. Okay? Um, so what I want to talk to you guys today about is, well, a little something about our identity. Uh, it's funny, actually. I'm sorry. I'm not used to preaching kind of without stopping. You know when you... In the end, I always have a translator, and I say one sentence, wait for it. Then I say another sentence, wait for that one, and then I say another one, and it kind of cuts you say, oh, so this is a bit more colloquial, I'd say, but that's all right. <laughs> anyway, so I wanted to talk about identity. You know, I, I, Mark spoke to me, and, and we had a little discussion about, you know, some things, what's going on, and what would be good to talk about, and, and Mark said, you know, it would be really good if you could talk about you know, what it's like being a missionary, and you know, a bit of, bit of why you do it, and, and yada yada, and I can't remember what you said, sorry, Mark. And, <laughs> and I thought about it, I said, oh, yeah, okay, well, that's good, you know. That's, that's, when I, I, I sat down, I thought, you know, what, what is a missionary? And, you know, I really thought about it, and I said, you know what, I actually don't know. I'm, a, I'm supposed to be a missionary, but I mean, so I said, what is, a, what is the job description of a missionary? You can't really, you know, well, go overseas, and then you just sort of stop there. You were the the ministry. Uh, oh. I mean, it just, there's really there's really no job description for a missionary. And you know, my whole life I wanted to be a missionary. And I mean, I guess I kind of fit into this. I'm overseas. I'm in ministry. Okay, I fit into this criteria of being a missionary. And I still don't really feel like a missionary. Is that funny? 
You know, I'm going to tell you a little bit of my testimony. Some of you don't know this about me. I became a Christian when I was 13. So, you know, I've been a Christian for, by the way, I'm not 22, Mark. I'm 23. <laughs> the big difference, by the way. I'm much older than that. <laughs> but it really matters anyway. So I became a Christian when I was 13. And uh, if you let me then, I was, you know, well, if you let before I became a Christian, you wouldn't recognize me. I was this, you know, cruel, cussing, arrogant, selfish teenager that didn't care for the world, thought Christians were stupid, church was boring, really, really cliche, you know, really, really, really original. So, <laughs> you know, that's what I was And then I became a lot of first days when I was 14. And my, my conversion was so insanely radical that when I actually used to catch the bus home every single day, an hour, home from school, and on a Friday I went home on the bus sitting next to my best friend, actually for an hour just berating him about how, how stupid I thought the church is and Christians and, and part of, you know, just a myth or whatever. And then I came back one day morning with a Bible and a Bible and a journal preaching to him. And I thought I'd lost my mouth. So this is, I've, I've had it, I've got you know. And that was, that was my experience. And so I went from being this, this, this complete heaven <laughs> to this sort of people and people with Bibles. So I had this really crazy experience. And ever since then, all I wanted to do was be a missionary. I was like, I just want to be a missionary. I want to do a full time in ministry and I want to serve God. That's it. That's it. That was the only thing I wanted to do. Before that, I had all these different aspirations. I was like, no, nope, that's it. God. I want to be God. That's it. I'm done. That's all I'm going to do. And, and it was a crazy time, the first time of, of me being a Christian. And um, not just the other people around me as well. Probably, probably um, it's only after that you want to become a Christian, some of find out all these people are praying for you. And you're like, well, I don't have much of a chance today, you know. Anyway, so that was, that was my son sort of became a Christian, and my mom was like, yeah, we're really praying for you, and my family was praying for me, and the neighbors are praying for you. And I'm like, goodness, my life's like a little book to you guys, you know. Anyway. Um, so now we're going to be a Christian. And suddenly I had this moral identity. I was a Christian. I was a real person. You know, and I had a purpose. My purpose was Jesus and ministry and I was a missionary. Because that to me was like the heart of my purpose. If I was a Christian, then the heart of my identity has to be ministry. Ministry, ministry, ministry. That's all I wanted to do. And then for three years I went through, I finished my school for another three years. In school, I just... Even my teachers, I was preaching at my teachers and my classmates, and it was just, it got a little bit out of hand. And I, you know, like, I, I had like a prayer meeting every day, trying to rally all the other Christians, and just all the nuts things, and, you know, looking back, I'm going, man, I was really obnoxious, you know, because I was an obnoxious Christian to go around. You know, and that was, that was what she out a little bit. And, <laughs> and you know, now I'm a missionary. That's, that's what I'm doing. And I was thinking, I was sitting down today and I was thinking, okay, well, we're going to talk about why I'm a missionary, and I guess that's important, and why I do what I do. I thought, well, then I've got to explain, you know, how, how I started and why I wanted to be a missionary. And really, the only reason I wanted to be in ministry of any kind was because I love Jesus. That was it, really, full stop. And so when I was in school, you know, all I wanted to do, as I've said this now several times, all I wanted to do was be in ministry, and I wanted to tell people that. You know, and you know, in Australia, we have this this funny thing. I, I, other countries do this as well, but in Australia, whenever you meet someone, the first thing you ask is, "What do you do?" You know, I mean, is that right? Is it, if I say, "Oh, hello, how are you? What's your name? What do you do?" People go, "Oh, well, I'm a da 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 da, and I do such and such." And that's generally how we introduce each other. You know, and that's fine. But what happened is, in our culture, we identify so much with our job. And our occupation, we identify so much with who we are according to what we do, our actions, physically, what we actually do as a job. And so when I first became a Christian, I thought, I'm not fulfilled until my occupation is ministry, because that's my identity. So I'm not a fulfilled person because I'm not really doing the job I want to be doing right now. So I was aspiring to, I want to be a full time minister or missionary, or that's, that's what I was aspiring to. Because all I wanted. You know, after, you know, all day whacking people with Bibles and preaching at people and rebuking people and just being this nuts Christian, all I wanted to do was be able to say, oh, what do you do? I'm, I'm a missionary, you know? I want to be, oh, I'm a minister, I'm a pastor, I'm a full-time ministry person, Christian, you know? And 
I couldn't. I said, oh, I'm a student. <laughs> and, and it's like my identity was in that. And I could say, um, well, um, I'm not what you think I am. I'm, uh, I'm actually just a student. <laughs> and, you know, some people go, oh, okay. Well, for some people go, oh. <laughs> you know, or, or some be like, hey, why don't you come to this and that? I'm a student. Oh, I love man. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's true. We really identify with what our job is or our occupation. And to me, that was really disheartening. You know, especially growing up when I was 14, I was kind of one of those kids that could grow a beard when they were 12, and so never quite looked my age, you know. And so ever since I was 14, it was like I, sometimes I try and pretend that I wasn't a student, you know, working, and sometimes people come up and, and be, and, you know, think I was like this guest speaker or something, and I'll be like, oh, yes, yes, yes. And then I'm too convicted, of course, and I'm like, I'm just a student. <laughs> and that was the first two years of my life. Was, and then finally, I, I, I got out there, I did some different stuff with Wyoming, and did some other christian stuff, and then now I'm a missionary. And you know what's funny? After being a missionary now for about two years, I've been here in Thailand, you know, and this, don't take this the wrong way, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be painfully honest with you. I honestly think in the last three years, I haven't actually done more ministry than what I've done in the first three years of my life. I don't think I have achieved more as being a missionary than what I did being a student. In fact, I think I actually preached to more people when I was a student in school than being a missionary. Now, I don't undervalue what I do. I love what I do. But I think sometimes we underestimate where we're at. We underestimate what our actual identity is. Now, I'm going to talk to you about a few people from the Bible. One of them you may have heard of, he's a really great guy, um, goes by the name of uh, Jesus. And uh, <laughs> I'm sure some of you have heard of him. Um, and you see, he was a carpenter for 30 years of his life. Now, if you're looking for the Messiah, you go, okay, we're looking for a Messiah. Okay, yeah, yeah, what's your name? Jesus. Mm, okay, what do you do? I'm a carpenter. No, no, sorry, I'm looking for a Messiah. Uh, oh, no, I'm looking for a Messiah. You know, Jesus wasn't, he wasn't, it, Messiah wasn't a job description. It was just who he was. You know, so he, he, was, he, was a, he was the salvation. He was the son of God. He was all those things, but it wasn't his occupation. In fact, his occupation was probably carpenter, and then it was rabbi. Never, never at any point was his occupation to be a Messiah. But that's his identity. That's who he was. That's who we know him to be. But for the majority of his life, his occupation was a carpenter. And now, I don't think Jesus lived really lying and thinking, oh man, I just can't wait for the day that I can finally be a Messiah, you know? Like, I can't wait to, to finally actually start living up to my, my full potential, you know? I think he knew who he was. I think he was perfectly content in who he was. You know, you know, one of the amazing things about Jesus' life, and one of the amazing things he did, I find this sometimes the most significant, is that when he got baptized, you know, this burning voice comes from heaven and says, this is my son, and here I am pleased. And that's it. And I mean, you're thinking, oh wow, yeah, he's really special. But you know what? Jesus hadn't performed one miracle. He hadn't, he probably, or maybe he'd maybe preached a sermon or two, but he didn't. There's no record of his ministry. He didn't heal anyone. He didn't preach anything incredible. He didn't do anything. He just made tables and chairs and cupboards. And God, of heaven and earth, says that this is my son who I'm well pleased. And, and I'm thinking, oh, okay, all right. And when you sit back and you wonder what he did, you know, with, oh, with God looking in the future, I mean, would the God mean oh, I'm proud of you now that you're in ministry? Or oh, I'm, 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 I'm going to be proud of you? Or, you know, he didn't just say, oh, this is my son, he's a good lad. He said, I'm well pleased in him. You know, he's, he's abundantly pleased. I'm, I'm stoked. This is my son. He's awesome. You know, because God knew his, his identity. He knew that Jesus was the Messiah. We were waiting for him to become the Messiah. God doesn't wait for us to become something. We already are. God's waiting for us to realize what our identity is. There's another man from the Bible called Gideon. And we all know Gideon. Well, most of us know Gideon. And he was literally in the lowest of his tribe, hiding in this little decrepit building, trying to beat what You know, you know um, how, you, how you thresh wheat? You know how you usually go outside in the wind, and after you thresh the wheat, you've got the the grain and the chaff, and because the chaff's so light, you throw it up and the chaff blows away, and then the seed comes down. That's how you kind of keep the wheat. He's trying to do that in a little room. Now, obviously, that doesn't work very well, so he doesn't look very good. 
Okay, and then an angel of the Lord shows up and says, Hey, why do you know of Allah? And he's like, Yeah, funny. <laughs> yeah, cool. <laughs> but why do you know of Allah? What, 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 what's this about? You know, and the first thing you do, what's your complain to God? Can you believe that? An angel shows up and says, Hey, who have you been? Excuse me, this is God, right? The funny one. God didn't say, Hey, you know, where are you? I'm going to turn you into a man of Allah. No, he actually showed up and said, That's not of Allah. That's how I introduced him, because God already knew his identity. God already knew that this man was a mighty man. He didn't have to become a mighty man of Allah. It was already in his life. That was his calling, and that's who he was. He wasn't going to become a mighty man of Allah because of his actions and his deeds. And, and, you know, they kind of come hand in hand sometimes, but so his identity was already given to him. God recognized that and saw that. You see, sometimes, I believe, but like what I do when I expect a Christian is we think we're, we're waiting for something. We're waiting to kind of get into our ability. We're waiting to get into our calling. But we're already in it. God's not, God's not looking at you going, oh, I just can't wait for you to, to you know, kind of get up to that point in your life where you're actually, you know, a mature, strong, you know, Bible thumper. You know, God's not waiting for you to become. God already knows what you are. God's just trying to get you to start acting like that. You could be, you could be passed out on the sidewalk. You could be drunk off your face. You could be completely useless. Doesn't matter. God's still there. But He's going to come out just this to you and He's going to call you by what you are, not by what you look like. Because that's that's just what you're doing. It's actually you know, a little less relevant to who you are. God's willing us to live up to our true identity. You take a breath. <laughs> is that okay with everyone? I don't understand. Some, some, there's, there's, a little, there's a kind of a little line here somewhere which I'm dancing on, I think. And it's kind of the, the blurry line of, you know, what's, what's you know, what, what, are our dads important or faith with action and yada, yada, yada. And probably some of you are kind of, mm, okay, okay. <laughs> we'll see where this goes, Stephen. <laughs> You see, um, now that, that, I, that I'm kind of, you know, old and, and wiser in my many, many years of experience, I've come back as, as, you know, lifelong missionary, I've come to give you this amazing advice. <laughs> and that is that don't wait, church and individuals, don't wait to become something. God's not, God's not, that's something wrong. You're not, gonna, not, you're not waiting to be changed. God's, Already ready for you to be who he's called you to be. You know, guys, you, I mean, right now we're not even in Japanese, but this isn't your building. This isn't where you currently you know, belong. This isn't what you guys have been used to for so long. But that doesn't change your identity. You're still the same people, and you're still the same church that was two years ago, or two years ago, or five years ago. You haven't become any, any more greater. Because you already are as great as you were called to be. But you're just not doing it yet. <laughs> now, it doesn't matter if you're, if you're a plumber or a plan. It doesn't matter if you're a doctor or a teacher or whatever it is. What really matters is do you recognize what your identity is? Do you recognize who God actually called you to be? And is that what you're acting like? Is that what you're living up to? Sorry, living up to is the wrong use. No. Not only living up to, is that who you are? Who, well, is that what, you're, what you're portraying? Is that your attitude? Is that your personality? Or are you insecure about it? You know, I was very insecure when I was first question because I didn't want to tell people I was a student. I wanted to say, oh, I'm a pastor. You know, do you not want to say, we're, we're an awesome mega church of some kind and capacity? You know, you might, you might want to stand and be like, no, this is, this is you believe, and we've accomplished this and we've accomplished that. But guess what, guys? You already have. That's who you already are. Jubilee already is an incredible, powerful instrument for God. You're not going to become one. You already are. God's not calling you to change into something. You already are. God just asking you guys to start to see that. Because when you see that, then it's going to change what you do. What you do is what comes later. What you do is just reflecting off what's actually going on inside you. God's never really looking at what you do. He's looking at what's inside you. Because that affects everything else anyway. You know? Guys, don't wait. Don't wait. Oh, we need a, we need a, a bigger service. We need more 
staff, we need more of this, we need more of that. No, we already are what we're called to be. And God's just wanting us to see that, see the gift. And we'll never see our full potential. But we don't want to be walking around tiptoeing, being insecure of what we are. Because then we're just going to be getting in the wine press. A mighty man of arrow that's not actually doing anything. And we just doesn't realize it. You know, he would, been, he would have been sitting there like, I mean, he would have felt pretty pathetic, you know. I mean, anyone, anyone else from the tribe of Israel would have looked at Gideon and gone, there's a cowardly man hiding in a wine press trying to beat some wheat. And he thinks, this guy's got no weapon. No hope for this fella. And he, led, he basically defeated the Midianites. He, he, he redeemed the whole, the whole um, tribe of Manasseh. And, and that was incredible. But no one saw that. No one saw, because all they saw was, oh, here's this little cowardly man hiding in a building. You know, and right now, guys it might feel like, oh, we're just this cowardly person hiding in a building. But you're not. You're, you're a mighty man of valor. And God's going to call you to do amazing things. You know, Gideon, you know, the first thing he did, the first thing Gideon did was actually complain to God. He said, hang on, God, aren't you this, this person that rescued Israel? Good. Have any fun with anyone? Good. I must, must be doing something right. I thought, no, hang on, I thought he was supposed to be doing something right in my offending people. Hang on, all right. I need to start picking on people now. <laughs> Alright, okay, I just want to, I want to, I want to experiment here, I want to try something. Okay. Everyone, everyone close your eyes. Close your eyes. Uh, everyone. Um, everyone, everyone. You two have them, come on. Close your eyes. <laughs> now, the reason I want you to close your eyes, you couldn't close. I tell you, I can see you with your eyes open. No <laughs> exception. I'm going to point you out, I'm going to call you by name. <laughs> no, okay, now the reason I want you to keep your eyes closed, just momentarily, so I don't want you to think about anything else right now. It's good to keep your eyes closed because it's a little less distracting sometimes. And you just listen to me and Haven and our beautiful voices. All right, now I want you to think for a minute. Keep your eyes closed and I want you to think. If someone was going to come to you right now you had never met and said, Hello, who are you? What would you say to them? Just, just think it through for a little bit. Okay, what are you actually going to say to someone that comes and asks you, who are you? Now, of course, you don't have to immediately respond with, I'm a man of the No, but I mean, uh, is your first response to quickly try and, try and say something that people want to hear? Or is it, just, is it just your job? Is it your beliefs? Is it your, is it, is it your identity and... Oh, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a teacher, or is it, oh, I'm a, I'm a builder? Is your identity in, oh, I'm a, I'm a Buddhist? Okay, all right, you can open your eyes. See, I wasn't going to do anything else. It was nothing, nothing scary there, guys. <laughs> I wasn't going to get you to put your hand up if you had some secret sin or anything like that. <laughs> all right. <laughs> but I just want to challenge everyone just to think, you know, what, what, what do we value? What do we want other people? to care about with us. For me, when I first became a Christian, I just wanted people to see me as this crazy Bible thumper, which I probably did actually, now that I think about it. I probably beat that into a lot of people. But um, what I didn't want people to see was that I was a student. Because to me, I was like, oh, that's not, that's not who I am. I don't want to be that. I don't want to tell that to people. But that's, you know, that's quite irrelevant. You know, we, we need to be really happy with, with who we are. We need to be able to say, you know what, I could be up here butt naked. I could be having, I could be completely on welfare. I could be a plumber or a garbage collector. It doesn't matter. I know who I am. I know what I'm called to do. And I'm fine with it. Me and Mark were having a discussion the other day about, um, about some incredible people that we've had in history and great inventors and things like We brought up um, good old Isaac Newton. Now, anyone who's probably finished year, year 12, which I did just, Okay, thankfully, you hear a lot about this guy Isaac Newton, and he was a scientist, a great man. And what you don't usually get told when you're in in school is that Isaac Newton was actually a Bible thumper. Did anyone know that? Yeah, a lot of people don't know that. 
Well, you, you saw his teacher, Jimmy Lewis, and I was saying, oh, yes, this is all about getting him here. He was a bit of a crazy preacher. In fact, in his day, he was more renowned for handing out Bibles to people than he was for being a scientist. And yet today, we use more formulas and more equations from him than anyone else. I was going to say something incredible. Now, do, what do you think his identity was? Do you think he, he'd, he'd go around to people and say, oh, um, I mean, maybe, maybe he's really insecure about being a Christian. Maybe he's really insecure about being a scientist. Well, we'll never really know now until we meet him in heaven. You know? But, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't held back. He wasn't, you know, oh, I'm, I'm just a scientist. Oh, I need to give up this, this science career before I can actually be in ministry. No, he was already doing incredible things. He was hearing from God on a daily basis, discovering things. He actually claimed, before he died, he claimed, in fact, all through his life, he claimed that every discovery was because God showed him. That's amazing. One of the greatest scientists of all time. And he said, just God showed him everything. When they were discovering light, or when they were discussing light, they had a bunch of scientists in the room. Half of them said, light is a particle. And the other half said, no, light is a wave. And he walks in, they go, okay, Isaac, you, you crazy preacher off the street, what do you think? And he goes, ah, it's both. And they go, oh, whatever, get out. Okay, now today, we've discovered that he was spot on right. It's a particle that behaves like a wave. And, and, he, and he, didn't, he had no idea. He didn't, he didn't look at a microscope or have the technology. He just, God told him. It's actually both. It's a particle that acts like a wave. And they're sitting here arguing, is it a particle? Is it a wave? It's a, no, it's this, it's that. He's walking, he goes, oh, it's both, guys. They're like, get out of here. You know? And that, that was kind of the knowledge that he had because he was so close with God. And yet he impacted the world as we know it in, in the science field. And yet, he was still such an incredibly strong Christian. You see, because his identity, he wasn't insecure about his identity. He wasn't waiting to become something. He wasn't waiting to become this incredible preacher or this incredible, you know, I don't know, something or other. I mean, when you think about it, ministry isn't actually a job description. I mean, it, I mean sorry, Mark. Being a pastor, I mean, it's, it's, it's barely a job description. Like, it's, 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 you know, it's so vast and very, I mean, it can mean anything. You know, if you tell someone, what do you do? I'm in full-time ministry. Well, you know, elaborate on that. Because are you full-time ministry and uh, are you working with children? Are you, are you, you know, are you a missionary? Or you could mean just about anything. And I don't believe that ministry was ever supposed to be just a, just a, a particular job. I think every single person it should be in full-time ministry. I don't think that we should be waiting to be in ministry. I think everyone should be in ministry right now, where you are, every day. I mean, I managed to preach to the same amount of people being in high school as a kid as I am being a missionary. And, and I remember sitting back and thinking, gosh, I didn't realize the amount of influence I had over people every day. I mean, granted, it probably didn't sink in so well as I probably hoped it did, and, you know, but I'm never really going to know. <laughs> But don't underestimate what you can do, where you're at. You know, I, I, when I first became a Christian, um, I had this class of about 20 people in my class, and it, by, by the end of the, the school year, the entire class became Christian. Now, I'm not sure if that was thanks to me being an absolute crazy Bible thumper, or if that was because maybe God was working on everyone at the same time, but, you know... God obviously was using me or someone in that situation. And it wasn't, it wasn't a local pastor. It wasn't a missionary. It wasn't, it wasn't anyone in full-time ministry. It was just students, ministering to students. Okay? Because in the end, it's going to be teachers and doctors and police officers. It's going, to be, it's going to just be everyday people that are actually fighting this, this fight between good and evil. It's not going to be pastors. It's not going to be missionaries, we're just holding a flag, really. I mean, isn't that right, Mark? I mean, you don't really get to do that much. I mean, your job's so taxing sometimes. You, you say, oh, golly, what did I do, you know? It's, it's, this, it's this kind of non-ending job. Most of the time, you're just holding this big flag and come on, everyone. Come on, come on, come on. And, and people are like, oh, see that guy holding the flag? Yeah, he'll fight the, he'll fight the war for us. We'll just sit back down and we'll just throw the pastors right off into, into battle. And, you know, as you know today, it's, that doesn't work. It doesn't work. Because I don't, I don't think pastors or missionaries or anyone are actually supposed to do much of the fighting. I think we're just supposed to wave the flag and leave all the hard work up to you guys. <laughs> so church, I, I know maybe I'm, I probably haven't been here long enough to, to know exactly where everyone's at and, and what, what, what's going on, but, but I do know that 
We don't need to be waiting for something. I do know we don't have to be waiting for a new building or waiting for God to drop something from heaven. I do know that we're already who we're meant to be. And God is just kind of like, get out there, go. <laughs> he wants to push us and go, look, come on, look look at yourself. You're actually, you're not, you're not awful, you're, you're great, you're amazing, just do it. That's, that's what he's trying to get us to do. He, I mean, honestly, imagine if I walked up to, I don't know, some homeless guy who's probably, you know, half drugged up or something on the street, and I just said, hey, mighty man of Allah. And he's like, what? You know, you think you, you're crazy. But that's how God treats us. And that's actually how we're supposed to treat the world and each other. We're supposed to impart vision. We're supposed to impart, we're supposed to encourage people. We're supposed to love on people. We're supposed to see past people's situation. We're supposed to see who people really are. And, you know, being cynical and judgmental is not seeing who people really are. That's just being cynical and judgmental. Because God doesn't, doesn't see this outward kind of stuff. He doesn't see, you know, he, doesn't, he doesn't bother that, oh, you got out of bed 10 minutes late today. He doesn't, oh, you tied your shoes a bit slowly, do you? You didn't sing quite loud enough in worship today. He doesn't do that. God, God's not concerned with that at all. God's just like, he just sees his children and he says, just go, do everything I've called you to be. And that little picture you made out of macaroni, that's awesome. Like, God's just stoked with us. You know, I, and in fact, I think, um, ah, okay, actually, I want to say one another. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and keep this fairly short. Okay, I don't want to go too long. Um, I have no idea what time I even started. Sorry, guys. I just gone completely past me. Anyone got an idea? Sorry? Someone's going to check. Someone's going to check. Well, that's a lot of them. Thanks, Jeff. I want to tell you just one last story, and this is something that I believe is so powerful in understanding who we are. I was listening in on this, this lecture one time. The person talking about the character of God. And, and in the middle of this lecture, they said, they said, no matter what you do, no matter, no matter who you are, no matter what you accomplish, you cannot make God love you anymore. And I thought, I thought what? That's awful. And I said, no, you can't make God love you anymore because it's not possible for him to love you anymore. He already loves you the maximum amount that he can love you. There is, no, there is no more for him to love you. God's not waiting for you. There's nothing you can do that will make him go, oh, I love you a little bit more now because you, you preached to a few more people that weekend or you did this or that. There's nothing you can actually do to make God love you more. You know, you can, nothing you can do to make him more proud of you. There's nothing you can do to make your identity more because it's already at its potential. You understand? God's not, God's not kind of holding back on his love and going, okay, you can have a little bit there. And, oh, oh, I was proud of that person. His love is already maxed out. And he's just trying to get us to realize that. He's like, he's like just don't, don't worry. I'm just, or just do whatever you want to do. I'm proud of you already. And for some of us, that's hard to understand because we're so used to trying to, to win people's approval or trying to or get people's attention in some way, even unknowingly. We, we've all done it. Like, I mean, we're all guilty of wanting to get someone's attention or wanting to get a, a good reputation at some you know, I think sometimes God actually gets quite a bit of fun out of watching our lives than we think, you know. And um, so I, I'm going I'm I'm to finish now. Uh, I'm not going to do an altar call. I'm not going to do anything uh, soppy. I'm not going to do anything emotive or anything like that. I'm just going to open up one second. I'm going to ask the team to come. If that's all right. Do you guys mind playing another song for us? It's worship. Let's have, a, just have another go. It's standing before God and worshiping Him. Nothing complicated. You don't have to do anything you don't want to. But I just want I just want us to fix our eyes on God. Not thinking about, oh, you know, and, you know, is God happy with me today? Or is this is this right or is that right or anything? Let's just stop and go, hey, God just totally loves me. He's not waiting for me to do anything. He's not waiting for me to accomplish anything. He's already totally and maxed out, stoked with who I am. So I don't I don't want to do anything. And that if you want, if you want to come to the front, you're welcome to just stand up here. You know, I, when I when I first became a Christian, I, I just loved running up to the front, and I, sometimes I look totally ridiculous. I remember this one time I went to a conference, and I'm not totally proud of this story. One time I went to this conference, like a leadership conference, 
And they said, if anyone wants to come out the front, you can come and, come and worship God. And it must have been like a couple hundred people in the band. And they must have had like 10, 20 meters from the, from the chairs to the stage because they want to be able to come up. And I was standing next to my brother, he nudges me, and he goes, you want to go up, don't you? And I was like, yes, yes. This is me at the height of my craziness, you know. And, and, and he goes, all right, He's like, just, just go on up there. And I'm like, awesome. And I just run up there. I literally stand like smack bang in front of the stage. Like the singer's probably like a few meters from me. And I stand there. I just lift my arms up shamelessly. And I just screaming and hollering and just shouting Jesus. And, and I just had no idea what was going on. Right? Turns out what happened is they, they kept the worship going for about 20 minutes longer because they were standing there playing going, um, is this guy going to stop? Like... There's not a single person. It's just me for like 20 minutes, and I have no idea. I had my eyes up, looked around, and went, oh, oh, I'm done now. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> and they, oh, my eye, they, just, they kept the worshiping for 20 minutes. <laughs> the drummers and so on, they go, oh, God, oh, please sit down. <laughs> I mean, I had no idea. You know, I was just shameless, just complete. I had no care in the world. You know, and although I probably held up the meeting and probably annoyed a few people, I didn't really care. You know, and guys, we shouldn't care because we're not out to impress God. We're not out to impress one another. It's just us and God. It's just us loving God. He loves us. We can't do anything to change how much He loves us. So I'm just going to open up. Just, just we're going to open up one more time for, for worship. We can go as long or as short as we like. And um, yeah, please stand. I'm not going to sing for you, right? <laughs> Come on. Thanks, Steve. That was awesome. There's a great song of identity, and maybe just some of the Spanish share plays kind of resonates in your heart. And we are his kids, so. You will never leave. You will never leave. 